David's going to come and read for us. Ecclesiastes 8, verses 1 through 10. Who is as the wise man? And who knoweth the interpretation of the thing? The man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment, and that in regard of the oath of God. Be not hasty to go out of his stand, his sight. Stand not in an evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever pleaseth him. Where the word of the king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Because to every purpose there is time and judgment, therefore the misery of man is great upon him. For he knoweth not that which shall be. Who can tell him when it shall be? There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death. There is no discharge in that war, nor wickedness to deliver those that are given to him. All this have I seen, and applied my heart unto every work that is under the sun. There is a time wherein one man rules over another to his own hurt. And so I saw the wicked buried and had come and gone from the place of the hope, and they were gotten in the city where they had so done. This is also bad. Father, well, we're thankful this word. You know that man's days are few and full. Point us to Christ, the only wise and perfect man to ever And we live only through his blood and sacrifice. Be with Ken today as he brings your message. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, for all the wisdom that the Lord gave to Solomon, the reading here in this inspired word, these thoughts that the Lord gave him, considering even himself with all that wisdom, and he begins with this question in verse 1, who is as the wise man? I dare say that any of us even with what God has been pleased to teach us of his mercy and grace in Christ. When we consider ourselves, even after all these years of reading and studying the scriptures, <laughs> the more we learn, the more the less we know. And the more we need to consider just how wise our Redeemer is. If there is an answer to that question, who is as the wise man? The answer would have to be there's none wise but Christ. Because if there were in any one of us any wisdom that would enable us in any way to live a life of perfection before a holy God, then Christ would not have had to come. The fact that Christ came should be proof enough that there is not among men any that can call themselves wise. And we're reading this from the testimony of one to whom God gave great wisdom. In fact, the scriptures say there's been none as wise as Solomon. And yet with all of that wisdom, when you read back over Solomon's life and particularly see his pattern of living, given that authority that the Lord gave him just to speak a word and it was done at his command. And yet we see how fallen he was. I thank the Lord that we have proof in scripture that the Lord did not leave him there. A lot of people ask that question. Well, how could Solomon be one of the Lord's in light of everything that he did? But wait a minute, stop and ask yourself, Look back on your own life, even to this point, how could I be the Lord's based upon what I know of myself? The only answer is there must be a wisdom outside of myself. There must be a righteousness outside of myself to which God by his spirit causes hearts of sinners like me to look and to consider and to see that no, in myself, there is no good thing. In this flesh, there dwelleth no good thing, but all is in Christ. That's why Paul, writing over there in 
1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24. Who is the wise man? That's really the title of this message, the wise man. I'd have to say it's none other than Christ. Here in 1 Corinthians 1, 24, this is what Paul declared. In verse 20, he said, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It's not that preaching itself is foolish, but the message of Christ as being all of salvation is foolish to deaf ears. It's foolish to people who are yet in blindness and darkness. And verse 22 still holds true today. What are people looking for in their pursuits of God? It says the Jews require a sign. You can take all of religion today and put it in one of these two categories. You've got the sign seekers. The ones that look after an experience, that preach up miracles, and tongues, and all of these things. Well, it was so back in Paul's day. There's nothing new. The Jews require a sign in spite of everything that Christ did and said and accomplished in his generation, in his day. Yet they still said, well, just show us one more sign. Let's, let's see if you can do like Moses, bring down manna from heaven. Then we'll believe. Christ told them that it was a wicked and adulterous generation that sought after a sign. But no other sign was given than that of Jonah. Three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. And so it is with the Son of Man. So they got one group over there. It's still today. It's not enough just to preach what the scriptures say about Christ and that Faith should rest in him and his work alone. Now they've got to see something else. They've got to feel something. And then you've got the other category over here that's described as the Greeks that seek after wisdom. I liken these to people that just sit there and pull on their beards and, and maul and think about and analyze. And they're, it's never enough just to read this word for what it is. They've got to go in and somehow come up with some new interpretation, like Paul did when he was in Mars Hill. They, they sat about, these philosophers, seeking some new thing. And there's plenty of that group today. They're always waiting for the latest book to come out, the latest author, someone to come up with a new way of approaching the scriptures. Greeks seek after wisdom. But what do we read here in verse 23? Paul said, we preach Christ crucified. Notice he doesn't just say Christ. But everything about Christ and the wisdom of God in salvation is summed up in those two words, Christ crucified. Who he is, why he came, what he accomplished, for whom he did it, and where he is now. Christ crucified. Under the Jews, a stumbling block. Why? Because they're after another sign. Don't be surprised that week in and week out, as this message is even preached here, that people aren't just flocking to hear it. They're out down the road somewhere because that's where the action is. That's where the happening thing is going on. Jews, and the Jews, this message is a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness. They're not going to sit and listen to the simple declaration of Christ and his cross. It's just not satisfying to their intellect. They need somebody with a doctor in their name to stand up and break it all down for them and then they think, wow, now we've got a teacher. But unto them, verse 24, which are called and there is the called. Who are the called? That's those that God has purposed to save and for whom Christ came into this world. Whether Jew or Greek, there's no difference there. And I love this, that yes, 
to the Jews a stumbling block, but yet there is that remnant for whom Christ came. And the Greeks, yes, seeking after wisdom, but now by the Spirit of God they discover that the wisdom isn't in them, it's in this one that God has sent. Christ, both the power of God and the wisdom of God. That word power is dynamite. What do you do to blow something up? You take it and dynamite it. Well, what needs to be blown up? It's anything regarding self and our own will and our own glory. But that's what the Spirit of Christ does when he's revealed the heart of sinner, destroys anything dealing with self, and reveals in that sinner that if there's any knowledge of God, if there's any wisdom, it's going to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the conclusion that Solomon was brought to after all those years. And as you read on down here in 1 Corinthians 1, that's God's business. He takes those things as it says here, not many wise in verse 26. Not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But again, I thank God it says not many and not any. Because Paul himself was one of those wise men at one time. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel and considered himself to be a wise man. And yet, the Lord was pleased to bring him down in his grace. Verse 27, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. What a blessing it is to take our place with the fools of this world. Not seeking after the smiles of, of this world. But God has chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. Those that think themselves wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and things which are despised. God hath chosen. Yea, and things which are not. It comes all the way down to that. There's nothing in this flesh that could ever serve or satisfy God. He brings it to naught. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. And that's really what we see Solomon doing in our text here in Ecclesiastes 8, turning eyes away from him, even though God blessed him in his kingdom more than any other king. And yet, as he reflects upon it, he realizes that it's not anything to him. Even as Paul wrote there in 1 Corinthians 1.30, of him are ye in Christ Jesus. None of us would be in Christ Jesus were it not of him, of God. Who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You can't add anything to that. That he, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. That's a quote from Jeremiah chapter 9. So the wise man, that's what we're looking at here. Coming back to my text. And the first point, verses 1 through 4, is clear that there's none wise but those that are in Christ. Here he says, and who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? Ask yourself, if you're a, a child of God by his spirit today, how is it that you know anything in reading the scriptures and the interpretation of it apart from the spirit of Christ in whom is all wisdom? in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, is the way Paul put it to the Colossians. If a man's wisdom, and this is by way of comparison here, maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. This is just talking about, by way of comparison, worldly wisdom. When there's somebody to whom wisdom has been given, much like Solomon, I'm sure that as he went about and made his proclamations that there were people that followed him. And when it says made his face to shine and with boldness, his face was changed. That wasn't anything in him. But it's a small example of what it is when God is pleased to reveal Christ in any sinner. Uh, that that wisdom 
causes that face to shine. Even as Paul wrote over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you look there with me, this is not wisdom in us, it's wisdom in Christ. When God is pleased to reveal him, there's a confidence. We're not going around wondering or speculating about these things that pertain to God's glory. It's not arrogance, but when it says that it makes the man's face to shine and gives boldness, this is what Paul spoke of here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says in verse 3, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. You know as well as I do, when you begin to talk to people about what God has been pleased to reveal to you in your heart concerning Christ, and you do so with boldness, they look to, at you like a deer in the headlight because they've never been brought to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you this, there's no greater blessing to cause the face to shine. See, this, this is a metaphor than to have this confidence that God gives to sinners, to have boldness in his presence. Not presumption, but boldness, that we enter into his presence through the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, with this boldness. It says here in verse 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. God doesn't have to reveal Christ in anybody. Believe there the word God should be capital G, even as it is up in verse 2. The same word God is used there. That there are those that he is blind. Even as he told Isaiah that they would hear but wouldn't hear. See, wouldn't hear. This is a judicial blindness that God has caused upon those that believe not. Otherwise, the light of the gospel, the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Stop and consider why it is that we believe this gospel. It's not due to anything in us, but it's God that caused it to shine unto us. And that's why Paul says, well, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. He goes back to the beginning with creation. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shine in our hearts. What is the face, when it speaks here of a man's wisdom making his face to shine, what is the face but a reflection of the heart? And that if God has commanded the light to shine out of darkness, to shine in our hearts, to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God, where? In the face of Jesus Christ. Just as God spoke and there was light in the beginning, so it is for any man who is wise that wisdom does not come from them, but it comes from God having been pleased to reveal Christ in them. That's what Solomon is writing about here. And that's why he says there in verse 2 concerning this wisdom, it's not in man, but he says, I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment, and that in regard of the oath of God. He's speaking there even himself as a king, where God had placed him there, just like he's placed rulers in authority over men for their good. Paul describes that here in Romans chapter 13. Any that have any authority and power in this world is because God has given them that authority. We're not to pick and choose. We're not to decide, well, I like this one, so I'm going to obey this one, or I, I like that one better, I'm going to obey that. No. It says in Romans 13, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. This takes wisdom in order to, even in desperate situations. Think about Paul's day when he was writing this. One of the most ruthless rulers was ruling in the world. It was Nero. In fact, Paul would in the end be decapitated and lose his head 
under this authority of which he was speaking. And yet we don't find anywhere in Scripture where any that are the Lord's children are called to rise up and revolt and rebel. And what we do, we bow to him who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's wisdom. That's wisdom that the Lord gives, that he would give us wisdom to learn how to live and know how to live in an evil day. That's true. Wherever rulers come down with rules and commandments that go against this word, then we have to answer like Peter did in his day, judge for yourselves whether it's better to obey God than man. Even rulers need to know that they are there by God's authority and only for a time, and then God can remove them. And so being children of God, living in this world as we do, as evil as it is, Rulers come and rulers go, and yet we're commanded to live as obedient citizens wherever it is possible, and to give honor to whom honor is due, and tribute to whom tribute is due. Verse 2 of Romans 13 says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. You're going to pay the consequences. You go against the authority. So this is what Solomon is giving as wise counsel. I'm sure there were many in his kingdom who were rebellious and who sought to work against him, not acknowledging that it was God that had put him in that place. It wasn't something he sought. And I'd say the same thing with regard to the Lord Jesus Christ. He rules over a world that for the most part is in rebellion against him, but it doesn't change who he is and his authority. God has set his king on his holy hill, it says in Psalm 2. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with thee. So this counsel in verse 2 I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment and that in regard of the oath of God, you think about what God's oath is. It's not to give man any glory. God's oath that of his, is that of his son. He's purpose from all eternity to glorify his son. And even these that are kings that he raised up over time served as a type and picture of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I say to any today that have an issue with the one that God has set to be king on his holy hill, hear his word, you do so to your own destruction. To say, well, I, I think that God ought to leave it up to me to choose whether I'm going to follow this Jesus or not. This choice isn't yours. Notice here the word, the commandment. I counsel thee, to keep the king's commandment and that in regard of the oath of God. In the Old Testament, whenever a king was anointed and set in power, the people were gathered. And this has been so, not just in the scriptures, but it has been so down through time and history. I'm following a series right now about King Henry VIII, if you want to know what it is for somebody to exercise authority and command it or lose your head, all he had to do was give the word, and boy, that head was gone. We don't know that type of kingship today. The view that most people have of God is he's a loving, kind of like a grandfather sitting there rocking in his rocking chair, and sure, the children mess up from time to time, but he's not going to hurt a flea. They think that somehow in the end that God caters to men and he's up there wishing and hoping that somehow people will be in subject to him. That's not how kings reign. You bow or you pay the penalty with your life. And that's the way it was. Every time there was a king appointed, the people were gathered 
And that was the thing about Henry VIII, why a number, why a number lost their heads, is because when he put out that order, I want you to go to every single person in this kingdom and get them to pledge allegiance to me. No other, or else they die. That was just, that's what kings did. Here, if you look in 2 Samuel chapter 5, and so that's the oath here. That's what he's talking about. Solomon, I counsel you to keep the king's commandment. And that in regard of the oath to God. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, this is with regard to David. When David was made a king over Israel, verses 1 to 3. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. They were taking an oath before God. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that led us out and brought us in Israel. And Lord, the Lord said to thee, thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king, to Hebron. And King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord. See, that's that oath before God. Before you go speaking against the king, consider that oath. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel. But before you speak against the king, even in earthly matters, before you speak against any authority, consider that there is a king over that authority that has put that authority there. And therefore, let your words be few in light of that oath of God. In other words, when the Spirit of God does a work of grace in the heart, we pledge allegiance to Christ and acknowledge that all authority is from Him. See, this shows our depravity because we're the first to complain if something's not quite right. Right on down to the weather. Why does it have to be raining today? Well, when you complain, what you're doing is actually complain against the very one who ordains these things. And this is why Solomon is saying there might be many in the world that consider themselves to be wise, and yet we prove ourselves to be fools just in how we react to authority, react to him who is over all authority, and that is God himself. That's why in verse 3, as you continue to go down through here, he says, be not hasty to go out of his sight. <laughs> Don't get mad at God's sovereign direction and will, even in your own personal life, and say, well, I don't have to put up with this. I'm out of here. Well, where are you going to go? Be not hasty to go out of his sight. Stand not in an evil thing. Be careful whether you say it or not, but even in your thoughts. This, this is why we need the wisdom of the Lord, because even in our thoughts, they condemn us. When we complain against God and what he orders to do so, it says very clearly, you're standing in an evil thing. You're taking your place in rebellion against the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Isn't this something that we need to hear every day? You would think as much as we know this to be true, yet God continues to prove that we are nothing but fools and how we need his grace and his mercy to keep us quiet in his presence. That's why Solomon asked the question, who is as the wise man? Because a wise man were we truly wise, we would bow. Our mouths would be shut. We'd be silent before him. But you can try to wiggle and squirm all you want to. I don't care what the situation is. And I'm preaching to myself now and you're just listening in. I don't care what the situation is. You're still not going to get out from under his authority. What does it say there? Who for he doth whatsoever pleaseth him. <laughs> Boy, in the good days... We love to hear that, don't we? Amen, brother. But in the storm, when the Lord's shaking the ship and the boards are breaking off of it, 
and you don't know whether you're going to live or die, he doeth whatsoever pleaseth him. And that's not just saying it. That's knowing it. But that, you wonder why he brings these things into our lives. It's, it's, it's to shake our gourds. It's to kill the, like he did with Jonah. He raised up that little vine, that plant, and he was rejoicing in it for a while, and then all of a sudden the Lord heated up and got rid of it, and there he sat in the, in the sun and the heat. There he died of sunstroke. And the Lord says, do you do right to be angry with me because I exercise my will? That's all we can say. So again, the wise, how we need the wisdom. Who is a wise man? It says in verse four, where the word of a king is, there's power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? You can preach all you want to, to the world out there. God's sovereign. He does what he wills. Preach it up. But guess what? You're going to be the living testimony of that in your daily life, and I will be. But when, when the Lord brings you low, as I've had different circumstances, even my own life, he lays you so low you can't even lift your head. And the world looks at it, and they mock, even as they mocked our Lord as he hung on the cross. He saved others, let him save himself. You'll have this world because the world hates this message. You'll have this world use it against you whenever you're in a deep trial. And they'll say to you, you say you're a child of God? What kind of God do you serve? What kind of God would do this to one of his children? Well, the answer is the Lord is king. Isn't that it in verse four? Where the word of a king is, there is power. If he's truly the king, then he exercises all power and authority to do whatsoever he will. He's not asking for people's counsel or advice, especially in running this world. But that's the kind of God that most people in religion today think he is, that he needs their prayers. He needs their intercession. No, we need his intercession. We need him to be our sustenance and our stay. Who's going to say unto him, what doest thou? This little peanut God that people have made up in their own minds, wouldn't hurt a flea, always need man's permission. He'd love to save you, but alas, he can't unless you let him. What kind of God is that? There's nobody before this God who is ruler over all, sovereign over all, that's going to say unto him, what doest thou? says in verse 5, whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing. See, that's what it is to bow. And that's the wisdom that the Lord gives, to bow to his sovereignty, to bow to his rule, to bow to his direction in every detail of our lives. That's what it is to keep the commandment. To keep it means that God's commanded it, so be it, Lord. You know, every time we say amen, that's what it means, so be it. Boy, you hear people say, amen, whenever it's to their advantage. To try saying that in a circumstance in which now a loved one has been taken out of this world or one suffering a great illness and you've got people running around thinking, we got to get more people to pray, got to get more, that we got to get this situation changed. That's not keeping the commandment. That's not saying, and again, keeping the commandment means God's commanded it. I may not know all the reason why, all I know is this would not be happening right now where God had God not commanded it. And so to keep the commandment is what? Keep your mouth shut. That not just the mouth, but the heart. God, give me grace to bow. And to say amen even in this. As it says there, one that keeps the commandment shall feel no evil thing. <laughs> if we truly believe that everything that comes from God's hand is from his hand, then there really is no evil that befalls any one of his children. It's but a
shadow, a valley of the shadow of death. But I'll fear no evil. I'll tell you, that gives great consolation when we're going through trouble. And notice, a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. It's not talking about natural wisdom here. It's talking about one in whom the spirit of Christ rules and reigns and gives that one discernment to see that even in that worst of evil, yet God is fulfilling his purpose and ordaining it. Think of our Lord Jesus Christ when he suffered on the cross. You know when it says there that he gave up his ghost, gave up the ghost of the Father? In the original Greek, that literally means he pillowed his head. That was in the in the in, in his death. He pillowed his head. Knowing that God, his father, would bless and honor exactly what he came to do. That's why verse 6 says, to every purpose, there is time and judgment. That word judgment means discernment. Therefore, the misery of man is great upon him. Even in the misery of man, God purposes that that misery should bring man low and that Christ himself be exalted. For he knoweth not that which shall be, but who can tell him when it shall be? See, that's wisdom again. And answer that question, who is as a wise man? To not try to figure out what we can't. You realize how much time we spend figuring out what we think things ought to be or how they're going to be and spend a lot of times talking about it? Here it says clearly, he knoweth not that which shall be. There's not a man that can know, so why are we talking about it? I don't even know whether I'm going to live through this day. I don't even know whether the Lord would take my breath even while I'm preaching. Who can tell him when it shall be? There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. So much for so-called free will. To think that somehow you've got power within your spirit to do anything. Do you hear these words? A wise man is one made wise by God as his wisdom in Christ. Does not see in himself any power to have any direction over even his own spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death. You know, if people truly had supposed free will, they'd just decide not to die. But here's what the word is saying. A man doesn't even have that power to determine the day of his death. And there's no discharge in that war, neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. Think about the people that give themselves to a false hope, false religion. They think that somehow that's going to save them. That's going to spare them. No. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. All this, Solomon said, have I seen and applied my heart unto every work that is done unto the Son. There's a time wherein one man ruleth over another to his own hurt. Even Solomon recognized that whatever power he had as a king at that point, it was given him of God, but it wouldn't be forever that another would come and take his place and think he's going to do better than Solomon. It's like when managers take over in employment. So the new manager comes in and he's, he's going to straighten things out. He's going, to, he's going to think that he's got this. The other one was no good. I got this. And then he does so to his own hurt. Such as man. That's why we don't put any confidence in man but in Christ alone. Oh, may the Lord grant us Wisdom in the way that any can be considered a wise man is to have that wisdom in the Lord Jesus Christ alone and that we give him in all things.